by Alfio. Uh, the, the main mentor is Lewis, so you can start, go ahead, introduce the student. Thanks. Yeah. So Alfio is a fourth year PhD student in the Integrated System Laboratory at ETH Zurich in the group led by Professor Luca Benini. Uh, his research is mainly focused on the design of digital ultra low powered system on chip for event driven edge computing. So today Alf Alfio will be presenting Figaro, improving system performance via fine grain in the run data relocation and caching published at Micro 2020. So Alfio, go ahead. Yes, thanks for the introduction. So as you just mentioned, this is a paper that was firstly presented at Micro 2020. And it, yes, it's Figaro, improving system performance via fine grain in DRAM data relocation and caching. Uh, just give me a second. Okay, so uh, let's start from the executive summary. So I would like to uh, state what is the problem that this paper is trying to uh, address. And essentially, uh, you will know that a vast majority of applications nowadays, uh, is, is it, it can be limited by um, what is called, um, let's say it has this performance uh, bottleneck that is mainly caused by essentially the uh, DRAM latency. We will see later uh, why. And in this paper, uh, actually this paper is trying to address exactly this uh, issue. Uh, and the goal indeed is to try to um, implement an indirect caching mechanism that tries to uh, mitigate this, uh, this phenomenon. During this paper, we, we will go through uh, some existing uh, um, indirect uh, caching mechanisms. So what is already uh, available and what is the state of the art. And we will see that mainly uh, all those approaches, they rely on the key idea of um, commonly enhancing uh, normal DRAMs with faster and smaller regions, uh, such that they can serve uh, reads uh, basically faster. Uh, we will see that all those approaches, they actually suffer from um, most of them from the same issue. So they try to relocate data at a very coarse grain, um, I'd say in a very coarse grain uh, way. And also we will see that all those approaches typically suffer from um, let's say a relocation latency that depends on uh, how far the data are from uh, the source to their destination. We'll see what, what does it mean uh, later. Uh, Figaro is actually a, a substrate for implementing this uh, in DRAM uh, caching mechanism, and it exploits the uh, key idea that this data relocation is done at a much, much uh, finer uh, granularity. And we will see what are the benefits of, of doing that. And also Figaro, it's uh, capable of doing this data relocation mechanism in a, what is called a distance independent, uh, let's say it has a, a distance independent relocation uh, latency. And we will see what are the implications of that. Uh, based on this, um, let's say um, substrate based on Figaro, we will see uh, how we can actually implement an indirect caching mechanism. And again, here, this, uh, the, key, the key idea here is, here is that uh, we can uh, put in our, in, in our cache only a portion of the, of the DRAM row that we want to, uh, to cache. Uh, and of course, this um, caching mechanism, we will be, uh, it, will be, uh, it will benefit from the fact that, um, let's say, the, the latency it's, it's all the same, and we will see that this actually simplifies the, the design and the implementation of the indirect caching mechanism. Uh, through the presentation, we will go uh, through the results that are presented into the paper. So we'll see that, uh, let's say, the figure substrate plus uh, the indirect caching mechanism that is building on top of it allows to improve the average system performance by uh, approximately 16% and overall reduce the DRAM energy by approximately 8%. So eventually we will uh, be able to conclude uh, that Figaro enables fine-grained data relocation at very low cost. And the FigCache, that is the caching mechanism that is building on top of it, actually outperforms uh, all the state-of-the-art uh, coarse-grained in DRAM caching uh, mechanism. Uh, Let's jump directly into, um, let's say, into the background problems and goal uh, that we will uh, describe in our presentation. So just to give you uh, a bit of context, uh, 
modern applications typically are required to store a very large amount of, of data. Uh, it, this is very intuitive if you think, for example, to uh, machine learning applications like CNNs, they always need to um, rely on a big storage space. Uh, the storage page, uh, space, uh, it's something that it's, it, it cannot be provided by on-chip memories that typically um, provide only a few hundreds of megabytes of, uh, at, at most. Uh, of storage. So in order for those applications to run, we need to uh, somehow rely on, on external memories and we need to transfer data from, uh, from those memory. Those memory are, are typically implemented as, uh, as DRAMs and they um, actually show much, much uh, higher um, storage capacity. So few tenth to several hundreds, hundreds of gigabytes of data. Uh, as I was mentioning uh, in the executive summary, the, the problem is that um, over time, uh, there was this need for bigger and bigger uh, memory. So uh, over the years, uh, DRAM manufacturers tend to fabricate uh, always denser uh, DRAM memories, and they actually managed to decrease the, um, let's say the cost per bit significantly decreased over time. However, uh, if you consider, for example, the access latency, uh, this is um, a feature that did not decrease at the same uh, pace. So nowadays we still have, uh, let's say, big memories, but they are very often characterized by a very high uh, access latency that they are now representing the real uh, bottleneck of, of many applications. The goal of, of this work is indeed to uh, try to mitigate uh, this, uh, this phenomenon. So the, the ultimate uh, goal is to reduce this uh, DRAM access latency. And in order to, to do that, uh, there are several uh, things that, that, we can, that we can do. So uh, first, uh, let's say a very good thing would be to exploit uh, the existing DRAM uh, circuitry that we have available in our uh, DRAM memories. Uh, right. Then, uh, second aspect would be uh, we we should try to serve uh, most of the memory reads from um, a memory region that that is fast. So that's why an Indiram cache can actually be, be very beneficial for such type of application. And in order to do that, uh, we need to have uh, a memory controller that is capable of uh, somehow understanding what are the data that that are meaningful to be relocated into, um, into this uh, DRAM uh, cache. So what are the, if you want, the hot data that we need to bring into the cache. Before entering into the core of the presentation, I want to uh, give you an overview of, uh, for example, how a, a DRAM uh, chip uh, can be uh, organized. This is a very high level description. So typically a DRAM chip contains uh, multiple banks and they, they all operate in, uh, in parallel. Uh, what does it mean? That each bank can essentially serve uh, an independent load and, and store operation. Okay, so then if we dig a little bit uh, deeper into the, into the DRAM chip, we can, we can try to explode, for example, a single bank. And you will see that internally, this is composed by uh, what they are called uh, subarrays. Uh, those subarrays, they are all connected to a global row buffer, which allows to uh, bring uh, the data um, out, let's say, to the chip I.O. Uh, interface. Let me take the laser pointer just a second. Okay. So then if we uh, explode a little bit uh, more, uh, let's say, what, what we have inside uh, a subarray, we can see that uh, each of each of these is um, typically a 32 to 64 uh, bits two-dimensional array of DRAM cells. So uh, they are, uh, this is something we have seen uh, very often already uh, during the, the seminar, right? So uh, we know that uh, those bit cells, they are organized in uh, bit lines and, and word lines, and they are all connected to a local row buffer uh, which uh, contains, uh, let's say, the circuitry that is needed for extracting the, the content of each of, of these RAM, uh, DRAM cells. A uh, few observations here. Uh, these subarrays, uh, they don't behave all uh, the same way. So uh, in the sense that we can have subarrays that are uh, a bit far from the global row buffer, 
and they will be slower, for example, compared to subarrays that are uh, closer to this uh, global row buffer. So in a sense, uh, it, it, let's say the, the access time of those subarrays, somehow it might depend on how far they are from the global row buffer. Uh, now let's see uh, how we can extract uh, practically, uh, for example, the content from one of these uh, DRAM cells. Uh, we all know that uh, one, one of these cells, for example, it just uh, stores uh, a certain amount of charge, which uh, represents a zero or a one, okay? Uh, we have uh, sense amplifiers. Uh, we don't have the time to enter into the details, uh, but uh, they are essentially, it, it's a circuitry that allows to um, see the, the short and balance of voltage of, on each bit line and just amplifies it such that it's easier for the DRAM cell to propagate its value to the local row buffer. And let's see now what happens when we want to read, for example, uh, the content of one of those uh, cells. So this is a process that happens in, in several steps. So first we have, um, uh, we have to activate uh, what is called a word line. Then the content of the word line is, is somehow propagated thanks to the circuitry into the local row buffer. Then we can issue the uh, column, uh, let's say a column address. So this is practically the read operation. And eventually, once this value is propagated uh, outside, we uh, pre-charge, uh, let's say, the value of the bit lines back to the original value that is typically VDD uh, over two. Uh, just a quick observation here. If we go back to uh, this condition here, uh, when the row is active, you can see that accessing, uh, for example, an additional bit line, uh, it has a lower cost because we don't really have to, um, let's say, open a new, uh, a new word and having the sense amplifiers, again, charging the bit lines to different values. So uh, this will be uh, very important uh, later. So, and, and this is what is called uh, essentially a row buffer hit. So in principle, we might just issue uh, other column decoder and propagate other uh, values to the uh, global row buffer here. Okay, so uh, before explaining uh, what uh, Figaro does and, and FigCache, uh, I want to mention a few uh, existing uh, designs. So a little bit, what is the state of the art or uh, in principle, what is uh, a common approach for building an NDRAM uh, caching mechanism. Uh, we mentioned before that uh, we have uh, very often long bit lines and they are typically to accommodate a large, uh, a large uh, number of rows, uh, right? So the main reason for that is, is essentially to have a big memory uh, capacity. Uh, many, uh, many works in literature, they propose a mechanism to alle alleviate uh, this, um, this phenomenon. And a common way of doing that, uh, or a common substrate for implement implementing in DRAM caching is, is to have a, somehow a heterogeneity in our DRAM bank. So having faster and slower region, and depending on the hotness of, of the data, moving uh, data from the slow regions to the uh, fast regions, okay? So this is uh, essentially uh, the idea, exactly like it happens in all the other uh, caching mechanisms we have seen uh, so far. Uh, I would like to start from, um, uh, therefore, from heterogeneous subarray-based uh, designs. And I would like to mention to you, uh, for example, a, a work that was presented at HPCA 2013, it's called Third Latency. Uh, where we have, uh, we don't really have a heterogeneous uh, DRAM bank, but uh, we have isolation transistors that are capable of uh, dividing the bit lines in two different uh, segments. So we can have a, a far segment, which is also bigger, and we have a near segment, which is closer to the local row buffer. And let's say these two uh, virtual segments, they are created by these uh, isolation transistors. This approach it has several advantages. And just to mention uh, one, for example, uh, coping data from uh, a slow segment to a fast segment is it's very easy because we can really operate a back-to-back -back, uh, activation and just transfer the content from a word uh, into the far segment to the one into the near segment. Of course, it has also some disadvantages because we have this, uh, it, it's a fairly intrusive approach because you can see that we 
really need to change the circuitry of the of the bank. And also, uh, these transistors, they might be not very optimized, so adding additional capacitance on our bit line, right? Then uh, we have uh, what they are called heterogeneous uh, bank-based uh, designs. Uh, for the moment, without a dedicated uh, data relocation support, so we can have uh, uh, this. This is, uh, for example, what was presented in, in Charm at ISCA 2013. Uh, the idea here is to have um, really through heterogeneous DRAM banks, where we have uh, completely separated slow subarrays and fast subarrays. So uh, it's on with uh, each uh, with its own dedicated uh, local row buffer. And uh, the idea here is that we can move data from this uh, segment to the other one just by um, practically uh, performing a read and the write operation. So uh, here the data, they, they actually travel through the uh, memory channel. So uh, this, of course, uh, it can mitigate a little bit the, the access, uh, say the, the latency we have in accessing the data in our DRAM, but it, this comes at the cost of higher energy for moving the data around. And also, this is something that might even interfere with the normal uh, operation of, uh, of the system. So uh, to mitigate or to uh, overcome this issue, there were a few other approaches like uh, DAS, DRAM, and LISA, yeah, that uh, equipped actually these um, like the DRAM banks with dedicated relocation cells. Uh, and this actually works, uh, but uh, we still have some uh, inefficiencies that are essentially summarized by uh, this uh, this few bullet points uh, here. Uh, so all those uh, approaches, including the last one, they suffer from a very uh, fundamental um, problem, if you want. So they can perform uh, data relocation at a very coarse granularity. So typically uh, moving an entire uh, row. And this is uh, quite big, like in the order of few, uh, few kilobytes, eight kilobytes in this case. We have seen that most of those approaches, they actually uh, use the memory channel for moving the data around, at least those that don't have dedicated relocation cells. So uh, this can actually interfere with the normal operation of, of our system. And also uh, in all those approaches, uh, we, um, we still have the issue that, um, for example, relocating data from a segment that is very far, uh, it costs more. So there is actually a dependency uh, of the cost, uh, the, the energy cost of relocating data. And this, uh, this is, uh, let's say, it really depends on how far uh, those segments are from the, for, from the fast subarrays, okay? So this uh, actually it serves as a, as a background for our uh, Figaro substrate, which I'd like to show you um, right here. Uh, the key ideas of, of Figaro and why it's, it's actually very interesting is that it enables this fine uh, granularity when relocating the, the data. And by doing that, um, we can actually see that uh, it's very beneficial because we can uh, just relocate not an entire row, but only the portion of the data that we expect it will be, uh, it will be used uh, in, in subsequent accesses. So we, we avoid actually bringing into the cache uh, data that we know already by construction, they won't be, uh, they won't be used. And also Figaro can, um, let's say it doesn't need uh, the data to travel through the memory uh, channel because this operation will be uh, done by exploiting the, uh, the very same Circuitry, circuitry that we have into the DRAM uh, bank. Let's see how it works uh, in, in practice. So let's imagine to have uh, two uh, subarrays. So a subarray A, which uh, is our source, and the subarray B, that is our uh, destination. And let's imagine we want to relocate uh, data from the subarray A to subarray B. So we want to move the content of a DRAM cell from here to here. The first operation uh, that we, we perform is, is to activate the, uh, let's say the target word line in our uh, source subarray, uh, exactly uh, the same way we have seen before. So this content is brought into the local uh, row buffer. 
then at this point, we uh, issue a dedicated uh, instruction, so a dedicated operation, uh, which we will call for the moment uh, relock. And we will enter into the details of this uh, right away. Uh, when we issue this operation, essentially we uh, provide a column decoder, uh, sorry, a column address to the uh, column decoding circuitry. And the content, for example, in this case of bit line two, it's brought into the global uh, row buffer. That is, this is common to the, to the DRM bank. So from the local row buffer to the global row buffer. Then the operation we perform is, is the following. So we issue a different uh, address here to the um, column decoding uh, logic. And we uh, propagate the content of uh, the global row buffer into a different position to our um, destination uh, subarray. At this point, what we do is to um, activate basically the word line into our destination uh, subarray. And this just calls uh, this data to propagate into uh, its position, its, into its uh, target um, word line, let's say. So this is, this is the very uh, simple mechanism that allows Figaro uh, to work. And okay, once this operation is, is concluded, then we uh, pre-charge back all the bit lines to uh, their original uh, values. Uh, we have two, uh, let's say small, uh, I wouldn't say they are issues, but we need to do some um, announcement to our DRAM uh, architecture in order for this operation to, to actually uh, take place. Uh, if you notice, for example, what we need to do, and this is something that typically a DRAM cannot really do uh, by, by default, is for example, to enable two simultaneous uh, row. The other point is that we also need to provide two uh, different uh, and simultaneous uh, column address. So let's see how this, uh, this can be done. Uh, let's take, for example, the simultaneous row uh, activation. So this is exactly our uh, issue. When we uh, activate the second uh, row, we still need to keep the first one uh, active. So uh, let me visualize a little little bit more uh, logic here. So we typically have uh, some combinational logic that um, actually activates our word line. And the addition that we need to do in order for this process to, to take place is to add an additional level of multiplexing and adding a ledge that is capable of retaining, let's say the original uh, word line uh, one, for example, uh, active. And okay, we do it also in the, in the destination subarray, even if, uh, for example, in this specific case, this uh, latch, it might not be used. Then if we move to the second uh, modifications that we need to do to our um, DRAM uh, bank. Uh, so for example, when we uh, say we, we have to provide uh, two different column decoding because uh, column address, sorry. Uh, because, for example, in this case, we are relocating from bit line two to uh, bit line one. We can, uh, let's say, uh, take a similar uh, road in the sense that we just add an additional level of multiplexing to the column decoding logic. And our relocation operation actually just needs to provide two different uh, addresses. So, as you can see, those uh, modifications are very, uh, are very small and Let's say it's not really uh, it's not really invasive. So now uh, we we have mentioned this relocation operation, but where does this uh, lower latency, for example, compared to the state of the art approaches, uh, originating uh, from? If you uh, if you look at the sequence of operation that we need to perform in order for relocating data, for example, from source subarray to the destination subarray. Uh, you can you can see that uh, it's not very different actually from uh, a normal read and write uh, operation. So in a sense, uh, in Figaro, uh, the relocation operation it essentially depending on how capable is the global row buffer. Uh, let's say in uh, 
decoding the let's say the, the source uh, value from the local row buffer and how capable is the destination local row buffer in driving the the bit lines and and this is exactly uh, the same uh, for for normal read and write operation where the the latency is is it's basically dictated by the two subarrays that are the farthest away from the global row buffer so now we have seen uh, how the substrate can work but let's see uh, how we can construct a caching mechanism with this substrate. Uh, as we mentioned before, the, the key feature is, uh, is, is that when we implement a caching mechanism with this substrate, a single row can contain multiple, uh, let's say, hot segments coming from different uh, rows. And by doing that, this has a very uh, beneficial effect. So uh, we actually increase the cache hit rate but uh, even more, uh, the row buffer hit rate uh, increased substantially because now uh, all the data into a cache line, they are potentially uh, hot data. Uh, this relaxes also some, um, some hypothesis because the fact that we have a distance independent relocation latency actually simplifies the, the caching mechanism uh, design in the sense that we don't really have to account for uh, for this uh, relocation uh, latency when, when moving the data. And the thing is that uh, thanks to the um, how figure is constructed, uh, it doesn't really do, um, it doesn't really need to have fast and slow region uh, for, for this mechanism uh, to work because already the fact that we can pack more hot data into a single cache line, uh, it, it, it can actually provide uh, benefits already, for example, in a caching mechanism that is implemented only with uh, slow subarrays. So uh, very quickly, uh, let's see uh, how uh, caching mechanism uh, can be, uh, let's say, what are the, the ingredients for this uh, caching mechanism uh, let's say, to be implemented. Uh, we have a, a row segment, uh, let's say, that, that, is, that is brought into, um, into our cache. And the idea here is that it will be accessed uh, later. So potentially this is a, a hot segment. We need a memory controller and the memory controller essentially just needs to hold metadata about the row segments that we, we bring in. And in this specific case, FigCache uses this, um, what is called the FigCache tag store, uh, which uh, stores few information about those segments. So let's see, into the details, what are those uh, information? Uh, the idea is very simple. So we have uh, a table that just holds the original address from the, uh, say, where the row segment is coming from, a valid bit, a dirty bit that is set to one if the if the request to the cache is actually, uh, sorry, to the if the request to the memory is actually uh, a write, and a benefit counter that is incremented every time uh, a segment is, is heated in, in, into our uh, cache. And this is very important because it's something that will be used for uh, the um, line replacement uh, policy we will see uh, right after. Before going to that, uh, let's see what is the, the policy for uh, just inserting a line into our cache. Uh, Ficash relies on um, what is called insert any miss uh, policy. For, uh, for handling the cache misses. And this means that essentially uh, uh, any data that is not found into the, into the cache, it, it gets inserted. Uh, the goal for that, or the idea behind is that we try to maximize as much as possible the, um, let's say the cache utilization. Uh, the nice thing is that uh, we don't need uh, additional circuitry for um, implementing this policy. And also in terms of statistics that we need to perform on the data, uh, they are they are actually very small, so we just need to have the the benefit counter. So uh, I was mentioning before the uh, cache line replacement uh, policy. So let's see uh, a toy example on how this might work. And let's imagine we want to just insert a new segment into our uh, cache. Here you have to use a little bit of uh, imagination. Imagine this is our um, cache and. Those are two uh, lines of our cache that are potentially candidate for, for eviction. Okay, so uh, the idea is that we use a cumulative uh, benefit counter. So each segment has its own uh, benefit counter. We sum 
all of them and we take the, the smallest. So in this case, row one is our candidate for being evicted from, from the cache. Uh, inside the row one, uh, we uh, go selecting the, um, the segment that's the lowest benefit counter. And in this case is, is the last one. And we mark all the other as candidate for, for being evicted uh, later. So in this specific case, we take the new segment, we just replace this one, and we leave those segments as marked for being uh, evicted. Uh, the idea behind is that uh, now that we open this row one, uh, next time we need to insert a new segment, we actually do it on the very same uh, row. And this is for, uh, let's say, going into the direction of what we, was, uh, we were anticipating before. So we try to pack as much hot data as possible into uh, a cache line. Uh, yes, this is uh, exactly uh, summarizing uh, this. So in this way, with this, with this uh, type of uh, cache uh, line replacement policy, uh, we pack, uh, let's say, data that are accessed close in time on the same cache row. And the idea here is that we actually maximize the row buffer hit rate because next time we need to access, uh, let's say, those data, it is sufficient to open once uh, even the, the cache line, and very likely uh, we will access those data with the same pattern as before. So we, instead of going into the cache, we just hit again the, the row buffer. Okay, so uh, let's have a look at the experimental methodology and then uh, the results. Uh, the setup for, for this uh, evaluation uh, is, is the following. So uh, we are talking about a DRAM uh, that has been equipped with a slow subarrays and two fast subarrays per bank with a ratio in terms of bit uh, of 512 and 32 uh, rows, uh, sorry, in terms of rows. Uh, the, um, the evaluation is basing on um, the cycle accurate uh, DRAM simulator for uh, simulating specifically the DRAM. And of course, uh, let's say several applications have been uh, used and traced uh, for, for, doing, for computing the statistics. So for doing that, uh, let's say in the paper, uh, PIN has been used. There are all the, the references uh, in, into the paper. Unfortunately, we don't have the time to enter into the details. The row segment size uh, has been selected as one eighth of the entire uh, row and uh, uh, very low level uh, details about the, let's say for example, uh, the the delays of uh, the, the access delay and all the physical um, say features have been modeled by using an open source spice uh, model uh, in terms of uh, benchmark suites and applications that have been uh, executed during the, the evaluations uh, we um, okay there are applications for several benchmark suite but the important thing to mention is that they have been uh, divided into memory intensive and less memory intensive. And when I say uh, this, I mean uh, memory intensive, uh, let's say we're talking about applications with more than 10 misses per kilo instructions. And uh, the other one is smaller than 10 misses uh, per kilo instruction. Okay, so uh, let's, uh, let's move to the result. Uh, the first thing I'd like to show is the, the weighted speed up. Uh, this is in the case of a multi-trade uh, multi application. And we are uh, comparing, uh, uh, let's say a state-of-the-art approach with two flavors of fake cache. So one with only slow subarrays and the other one with uh, fast and slow subarrays. Uh, you see that the speed up over the baseline, okay, first of all, it depends on how intense, how memory intense is, is the application. But this is, this is quite intuitive actually, because the more you use the memory and the more you can benefit from accessing this memory faster. Uh, then for, uh, let's say less memory intensive application, we have a, a speed up over the baseline of approximately 13%. And in the other case, like when the application is really a memory intensive one, we have a 27%. So overall this adds up, uh, or this averages to 16% uh, of, uh, let's say speed up uh, over the baseline. And actually uh, the last two cases are a very ideal implementation of caching mechanism. And we can see that, um, let's say the, the implementation with the fast subarrays actually approaches uh, those two uh, let's say um, implementations. 
In terms of energy saving, this is uh, this is also very very interesting. So we can do some some consideration here. This is the uh, here we are representing the energy normalized, um, let's say uh, across different components of our of our system. So they are represented as a stack uh, bar, and again here we we can find the same trend. So the more memory uh, intense is our application, and the more benefit we see. And here we can actually see, uh, for example, uh, that um, most of the benefits, they are coming from two, uh, two aspects. One is the higher DRAM buffer hit rate. And this we already uh, know it, but there is a very nice side effect that whenever we are able to access the memory uh, faster, uh, this, this uh, improvement actually propagates on the energy consumption of all the components proportionally assuming that they consume the same power. Because if we reduce the time, uh, in principle, the energy on each component is it's, it's lower. So, okay, uh, last uh, result. Uh, this is the in-DRAM cache heat rate. Uh, we can see that uh, the in-DRAM cache heat rate, so overall, uh, how much uh, we are capable to just read from the, from the cache, instead of going to the memory, it's quite in line with, with the state-of-the-art uh, approaches. So here we are comparing against uh, Lisa Villa. Uh, but this is the very interesting uh, fact that um, the DRAM row buffer hit rate is extremely uh, higher. And this is uh, really due to the fact that we, we can pack as a lot of hot data into a single cache line. So, uh, Okay, this uh, basically concludes the talk in terms of uh, results and, um, and implementation of, uh, of the Figaro and the Fig Cache uh, mechanism. Uh, let's move to the, uh, uh, let's see once again, uh, what were uh, our goals and, uh, and what we, uh, we have seen. So we uh, started from our problem, which was uh, represented by the very high uh, latency in accessing uh, DRAMs. Uh, therefore, the goal was to try to reduce this uh, DRAM latency uh, by implementing in DRAM caching mechanism. We have seen that, uh, let's say, state-of-the-art approaches, they already exploit very interesting ideas like uh, having subarrays with fast and, uh, and slow uh, regions, but their relocation strategy was too coarse and also uh, very dependent from uh, the physical distance between uh, these slow and fast regions. Uh, Figaro, it's, it's actually a nice substrate that allows to, um, to overcome this, this issue. Uh, so it allows to pack data into the cache in a much, much uh, uh, finer way. And in a distance independent relocation, uh, let's say with a distance independent relocation latency. So Fig cache that is building on top of it actually can, can exploit this. And uh, just by uh, relocating a portion of, uh, of hot, uh, let's say, uh, rows. Uh, the results we have seen that uh, the average system performance improves by 16% and the energy is reduced by approximately 8%. So uh, this actually, uh, it's enough to assess that uh, this fine grain uh, relocation, it comes at low cost and the fit cache outperforms actually state-of-the-art coarse-grained in DRAM caching uh, approaches. Uh, just to, to mention the, the strengths of this paper, uh, I, I like the fact that uh, this paper actually exploit a very simple but yet very effective idea of just reducing the, the granularity uh, of, of the segments that are being relocated to really have a huge benefit. And also the fact that the latency uh, in sensitivity, if you want, it's, it's something that is enforced by construction from, from the say from, from the way the substrate is implemented. Uh, yes, then it's, it's a very nice paper, so simple and easy to read. And also, uh, unfortunately here in the interest of time, I couldn't read go. Je savais que sa mère n'était pas sa mère, bon, parce que sa mère euh, d'adoption. Et je suis donc par des copains qui m'ont dit, moi ça m'a mm. pas dérangé, donc je lui ai posé la question au début. Sorry, I don't know what happened. <laughs> So uh, yeah, uh, 
the results are presented very clearly and the evaluation is, is much more uh, extensive uh, compared to what I, I show here. Uh, weaknesses of, of this paper, uh, let's say, uh, uh, for this approach to work, it actually, uh, we still need some, uh, some quite invasive uh, or quite intrusive modifications in the sense that we need additional circuitry to be added to our uh, logic. And also, uh, I think uh, probably the, uh, the effect of uh, additional level of multiplexing, it might be uh, investigated a little bit farther because we are talking about very large uh, multiplexers. A few uh, bit more personal considerations. So uh, I think this, this approach has a very, very broad applicability as uh, even though it requires some modifications to the circuitry of the DRAM, uh, let's say it relies on aspects that are very uh, common to most of the of the DRAMs. So I think it's it's very easy to implement actually, uh, and also the fact that it can be fine tuned on on the very specific application uh, because uh, there are few aspects that can be uh, optimized at runtime. For example, the size of the segment that we are uh, going to relocate. So nothing is really hard coded uh, by by design. Okay, so this actually brings me uh, directly to the uh, to the discussion. So I would like now to open, uh, let's say, to, to some input on, on your side, uh, and I would like to start with um, with the first question. So, do you think we can we can use Figaro, for example, when we also have uh, ECC uh, chip in our in our DRAM? Uh, Memory. I think you can, right? Because, I mean, if I understand it correctly, you're just designating like a part of the DRAM uh, subarrays as like the fast subarrays. So in the end, if you just apply error correcting code to those um, rows as well, it's just the same, right? Yes, yes, uh, I think exactly, exactly. So uh, yes, the idea is that you can, you can just apply to the segments you are, you are relocating. Uh, of course, this is something that you, um, you have to uh, account Right uh, when when constructing or when uh, deciding, uh, say how many bits you are uh, going to de to dedicate to uh, the segments, right in your uh, cache. But yes, I think this is this is um, I also think this is something absolutely doable. Yes, I don't know if someone has some other uh, input. Okay, so if not, I would uh, like to move to another uh, thing. I, I think it's interesting to discuss. So what do you think are the security implications, for example, when using uh, this particular substrate? Because during this, this seminar, we have seen uh, actually quite some, uh, let's say uh, vulnerabilities or, or attacks. So, why do you think Figaro, uh, let's say, is, is very effective or it's very weak in terms of, uh, let's say, data uh, security or overall vulnerabilities? Okay, so uh, if uh, this is actually something very, very interesting because uh, we have seen, for example, in um, when we talked about 
uh, row hammer uh, that the fact that you open and close uh, a word in, into the memory, it can be uh, it can be exploited to induce some uh, bit flipping. So, do you think it's uh, it's something that uh, it gets impact or, or it's um, I say it, it gets mitigated or uh, worsened uh, when using a substrate uh, like Figaro? I'm not sure it necessarily gets like less bad, but you probably lose precision since the rows you are hammering are the ca are probably gonna be the cached rows unless you find some mechanism to. Actually, you, if you if you have a very intelligent attack, you might be able to uh, arc uh, to orchestrate in some it in some way that the cache will always miss, but you might also lose speed in that way. So I don't know if it yes. would even be possible. Yes, yes, exactly. What you say it's 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 very it's very on point because, uh, for example, uh, if you think about uh, exactly what you what would you would do in uh, when when using such type of attacks, I mean, you try to uh, to induce, for example, a, a cache miss, but uh, the fact that you uh, you try to uh, pack as much hot data as possible into uh, into a cache line, it it plays against uh, such type of attacks, right? So. If your attack is not very smart, you will always uh, hit basically the the row buffer. So you you don't even get into the uh, opening a new row, not even into the cache. So I, I would say in this in this direction, it's actually something that might be exploited against this uh, such type of vulnerabilities, right? Okay, so if uh, if someone has some other input on this point, otherwise we can uh, move to the to the next one. Uh, yes, this is this is the um, the last one. Uh, this is a bit more uh, an open question. Like, do you, do you envision uh, other use cases, for example, for uh, for this substrate? Uh, because, for example, for the moment we we have seen it in um, as a substrate for implementing uh, data relocation uh, mechanism. But uh, is there any other application you can imagine that might benefit from having such type of capabilities into your uh, DRAM? I'm not sure you will. I mean, I think uh, like the capability of having data relocation aside from caching is is pretty massive. Like you can do a lot of very. F if you can if you can do this by uh, control it from the application, like this could be a lot of speed up if you need to somehow. For example, like um, if you have some complex trees, data structures, and you want to optimize access to them, and your application has more knowledge about this than the cache system could get, you could optimize that in the application. It would otherwise be a very slow thing to do. Yes, so, yes, but... indeed. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, this this is this is very interesting. Exactly, having already uh, you know possibility of uh, moving data into your memory without necessarily having them travel through the memory channel. Yeah, this actually, uh, it, it relieves a little bit the, the effort on, yeah, all the, all the applications that needs to move data around. Yeah, uh, I was thinking, for example, um, uh, to applications or uh, to uh, different fields like uh, in-memory computing, for example, this is something that, uh, it might might benefit quite uh, quite a lot for from from such a capability or for example figure can can be a, a substrate also for uh, some in memory uh, operation right uh, i'm i'm thinking about okay maybe having a bit more intrusive uh, modifications to the DRAM circuitry but you might even compute like small operation instead of just simple uh, relocation uh, operations 
yeah like uh, i had an other ideas from what you said so for example like a shift operation where you could maybe like move around some part of the data to the back of another part of the data and then that would be yes. a lot faster because it's directly in memory yes exactly yeah, I mean, also, also because the, exactly the, that operation is is uh, it's quite simple uh, yeah. computing wise uh, but still it requires to access potentially a huge amount of data right yeah i mean anything really that requires like blocks of some data and not the whole row mm -hmm. um, is pretty much uh, benefited like for example if you have to update the value of an array from some other location in the in uh, some other stored variable then you could just put uh, relocate that really yeah yeah exactly I wonder how hard it would be to uh, improve the granularity from block level to to a com total bit level access, so you could just select any section of the row and move that around. But might be a lot of effort, though. I think the I think the easiest implementation I can think of is uh, selecting two blocks and bit mapping them. But that might already be too much effort for a for a supper. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, another thing that I just thought about, and I didn't really think it through, but it just came to mind was uh, like, if you have compute in memory, which uh, was presented in other papers, uh, in other presentations in this course, even mm -hmm. that work in one subarray, then you could maybe even do a lot more complex computations. And even with this relocation, really move around the data even to other subarrays. Yes, yes, I exactly, mean, exactly, yep. Okay, so any other uh, input? Or also uh, general questions on what you have seen in the presentation? All right, so in that case, I'd like to thank you for your attention and um, just conclude my talk uh, here. Yeah, thank, thanks, Alfio. I think I'll make a couple of comments. I think uh, you yeah. covered it. Uh, you covered the basic ideas and basic results quite well. There are a lot more results in the paper, of course, as you mentioned. Uh, exactly. Then can be covered right now. But uh, I'd recommend people to take a look at the paper because uh, I like this paper. I mean, this is state of the art in terms of uh, in DRAM data movement. And granularity was a huge problem with prior mechanisms, as Alfio mentioned. Uh, yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And granularity is always a problem, I think, in the memory <laughs> system. We always have this granularity mismatch problems. And fine granularity usually comes at high overheads. But mm -hmm. this paper develops a nice solution that provides fine granularity as re at relatively low overhead, which you usually don't see, actually, yeah, yeah. in many <laughs> solutions. But uh, yeah. Uh, I will make, uh, and I think uh, the uh, the discussion on the synergy with PIM processing inside the memory chip is certainly uh, uh, good because uh, that was one of the reasons why we went through went out through this path, right? If you want mm -hmm. to do processing inside the memory chip, you do want to have data movement mechanisms inside the memory chip also, and this can rela relax uh, how your data is organized in the memory chip, of course, right? Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah, so it, it's very synergistic with all of those in-memory processing mechanisms that we discussed and some we did not discuss in this course. I will make one comment on your comment on ECC. Actually, you have a very good point over there. Uh, I don't think it's as easy as you discussed uh, in the end because it depends on what you do and what kind of ECC you implement. If, if your ECC is in a, in a separate chip, uh, then you have a problem, right? Uh, because you're moving data inside one chip. Uh, or, or a rank, even, even rank, right? You're moving data inside the data chips and then you have an ECC chip. You need to be able to modify uh, the ECC uh, code word 
based on the data uh, that you move. And then there's no way of doing that, in my opinion, other than going outside the chip, which really uh, doesn't work with the approach that is provided, right? Because you don't want to go outside the chip to move the data. Uh, yeah, that's, that, that's, that's, that's true. That's true. Yeah. yeah. So basically, I think it doesn't work with rank level ECC, which fundamentally assumes that memory is dumb. <laughs> basically, uh, the, the rank level ECC that's employed today assumes that memory uh, is not an active component. Memory mm -hmm. controller does everything related to ECC. So it reads all the chips and then computes the ECC and writes it into the ECC chip, right? And I don't think that's, all right. that, that, that doesn't work with any sort of NDRAM uh, data movement or operations you do. That's why I think ECC, rank, uh, ECC need to be rethought for NDRAM operations in general. Uh, so if, you, if you're thinking, if, if you compute ECC inside the DRAM chip, then you should have the logic to do that. And you just need to modify the logic that does that computation based on what Figura does. So that's easy, of course, uh, mm -hmm. but it still needs to be rethought. But yeah, it's a, it's a very good point, basically. You, you need to think about ECC uh, if, if, you, if, you, if you want to do this. But again, I think uh, since, since the approach is data-centric, I think ACC also needs to be more data-centric going into the future as opposed yeah, yeah, to pro yeah. processor-centric. Okay, very good. Uh, I don't have any more comments other than saying that uh, I think there's a lot more in that in this direction, clearly, in DRAM, in memory computing and data movements. And there's, there's more to do, I think. I think with that, I, I will say that I think this is the last presentation of the seminar. Uh, so thanks, everyone, for attending and presenting, even though it was a tough semester with just Zoom. Uh, hopefully... Uh, well, maybe you will, you're not going to be taking it, but hopefully we'll have this course again <laughs> in, in person with the better in-person presentations and in-person interactions uh, next semester. You kind of missed out on that this semester, but we didn't have a choice. <laughs> yeah, but maybe, maybe you were able to participate uh, uh, because of the online nature of the course. That also helps, I think, some people. Okay, I think uh, Mohammed can probably conclude and talk about the synthesis report, etc. Thanks a lot, Honor, and thanks, Alfio, for the great presentation. Yeah, I second what uh, Honor mentioned uh, about the semester. Yeah, we, I, I hope we had a lot of fun with all the topics, with the various presentation we had. So for the synthesis report, uh, you can access the one from previous semester. You can get uh, more insight about what we are asking for. Uh, I think it will be straightforward if you are attending all the, the sessions. One important thing is that we ask you if you are interested to continue whatever ideas uh, you propose during your presentation as semester project or research project, or it could be your bachelor thesis, master thesis, and so on. So you can consider that and start contacting us if you are interested in doing research related to the paper you presented or could be anything else, basically. We will contact some of you as well uh, based on the ideas that you are presenting or something else. Uh, for today, uh, we have the quiz. I think I will enable it in a couple of uh, four minutes, let's say. So don't forget to take the very last quiz. And I wish you all the best for all of you and uh, have a very nice semester. Stay healthy and safe. Uh, unfortunately, we won't meet next week. So yeah, hopefully we'll meet in other courses probably. Right, thanks everyone and enjoy the rest of the day. Thanks, bye.